This right here is a $2,000 3D printer that I spent over 40 hours building myself, and it is by far the best, the fastest, and the most accurate 3D printer I've ever had. And I know a few things about printers. But while I bought those other printers, this printer started as a pile of aluminum framing, electronics, 3D printed parts, and custom cut polycarbonate panels. This is a Ratrig V-Core 3.1 do-it-yourself 3D printer, and you can't buy it. You can only buy a kit and build it the way I did. This is one of the most fun and rewarding projects I've ever done. And in this build series, I'm going to show you all about this printer and why it was worth every penny and every minute that I spent building it. <music> Greetings. This is Obsessive Engineering and I'm Alan Reiner and this is my do-it-yourself 3D printer build experience video series. This is actually chronologically the last video in the series, but this is all about the finished printer, showing it off, its features, and a lot of cool stuff I printed with it. So I thought it would actually make a good intro video so that anyone watching would get some good expectations about what you get out of this process. There are a total of five other videos in this series, uh, before this one or after, depending how you look at it. It's mostly a mix of time-lapse and explainer content, explaining how printers work, how this printer works, uh, various printer technologies, and everything that went into this printer. And I'm not sugarcoating this process. You're gonna see a lot of ups and downs that I went through throughout the 40 hours building this thing. <sighs> but overall, this was really fun. I think that the build series was really fun. Uh, even if you don't know much about printers, I made this to give you an idea of what goes into this process so maybe you can get some of the build experience without actually doing it yourself. At the time of making this video, I've had this printer in operation for about six months and I've printed 350 hours on it. So I've got a lot of experience with it, not just to talk about its features, but kind of its quirks, its reliability, its ease of use. And I mostly just have great things to say about it. The last video in this series ended with my first couple prints, but before I had built the enclosure, I was actually gonna include the enclosure build as part of this video series, but my printer is actually an old style enclosure. And since then, Ratrig has released Enclosure 2.0, which is supposedly superior in every way. So I don't think it's all that interesting or useful to show that process. What is interesting is that, it, that I do have an enclosure. It works extremely well, the old one and the new one because it's a first class feature of the rat rig. So I'll talk about the enclosure when I talk about features. And so with that, let's dive in. The most recent major thing I've printed is this giant orange trash can. I put a monster 1.0 millimeter nozzle and then printed it entirely in base mode. It's one of the few things I've printed that has almost made full use of the build volume. I would say more, but I made this awesome YouTube short about it. So let's just watch that instead. I finished building this printer just in time to start my next major project, which was getting ready for Halloween. Not only did I want to print some of these like really big Halloween decorations, like this giant skull that's actually the size of a human head, but I was also able to print a bunch of stuff for the core attraction, which was making this 3D printed creepy face with a whole bunch of electronics and a really cool camera and some cool computer vision. This was like my magnum opus project and I made a really cool video about it that you should check out if you haven't seen it. I put a link up here. But the point is I had to print a lot of things and it was really nice to have this big printer that can print super fast and allowed me to iterate through all my designs really quickly to get this done. Next up here wasn't a functional print, but it was just something that I did as part of testing the printer that actually blew my mind the first time I did it because I didn't know it was possible to print bridges in any filament on any printer this long. This is a bridging test model that I downloaded from Thingiverse and it prints a series of bridges ranging from 25 millimeters up to 200 millimeters. One of the last things I wanted to show off that I did with my V-Core 3 was printing parts for this experimental paste extruder. I wanted to convert an old Ender 3 to decorate cookies. I initially just started out trying to 
put Nutella onto pieces of bread. It turned out to be a lot harder than I expected to extrude a viscous liquid out of a small syringe tip. So this wasn't wildly successful. I have some ideas for improving it. But the point here is this is a rather large fixture for manipulating the syringe that wouldn't fit on most printers. And even if it did, this would be like a 14 hour print. Yet on my V-Core 3, I was able to print this in about four and a half hours, which allowed me to iterate over this multiple times over the course of just a couple days. Now the V-Core 3 is marketed as the no compromises 3D printer option because it has all the bells and whistles that you could ever want from a single extruder 3D printer. And even the standard features that come with the printer are just implemented extremely well. All of Ratrix printers use 3030 aluminum extrusion instead of the normal 2020 that's used in more budget printers. A frame made of 3030 aluminum extrusion is just gonna be way more sturdy and rigid and handle way more forces and vibration than a 2020 frame ever could. And the rat rig printers also use linear rails for all axes of motion used on industrial machinery and is now used in higher end 3D printers. They can handle high speeds and high accelerations and really don't wear out like these V wheels that are typically used on budget 3D printers. They work and they're relatively inexpensive, but they're not the most accurate. And if you push the speeds and vibrations, they're not gonna be stable. Next up, we have the Z-axis drive. On most budget printers, you're gonna have one Z-axis motor and drive that's gonna move your bed up and down, but it's gonna be a little wobbly. And having two Z-axis drives that moves the bed up and down with more stability is considered a premium feature. The Rat Rig actually has three Z-axis drives with three motors. While it is a luxury, it's also a necessity. So it actually needs those three motors to move this heavy build plate up and down. But one of the things you get out of it is you get three-point bed leveling. And when you have three-point bed leveling, you can also tilt the bed any way you want, which is what the printer will actually do before every print is it will measure the height of the bed at the three corners, and then it can independently adjust those three points of contact to make sure it's perfectly horizontal. An auto bed leveling probe is another feature that's starting to become standard on uh, even budget 3D printers. It's not so much of a luxury anymore. And again, it's actually kind of a necessity. When you have a printer this big and a giant aluminum build plate, it's impossible for that plate to be flat at all temperatures. So before each print, after the heated bed has, been, has gotten up to temperature, that bed is gonna warp. And if you level the bed at the middle, you're most likely gonna be dragging the nozzle on the bed when it's towards the edge of the build volume. For every print, you really need that bed sensor to be able to probe the bed at each individual point and map the surface. Auto mesh bed leveling is useful across the board no matter which printer you have, and that's just part of the default configuration for all rat rig printers. And I know some of you are disappointed I haven't mentioned the Core XY motion system yet, but if there's one thing to know about Core XY, it's fast, it's accurate, and if you plan to enclose the printer, you can actually keep all five motors outside the build volume, which protects it from the heat. And if you want Core XY, you're not really gonna find it in any off-the-shelf printers because it's kind of complicated. And especially if you have to assemble the printer or maintain it, it's not really intuitive. So if you're looking for a Core XY printer, you're pretty much building your own. The Core XY motion system is actually one of the things that makes this printer so fast and why so many people in the rat rig community are into speed printing. There's actually a global challenge called the speedboat race using boats like this. This is a 3D Benchy. Usually on like an Ender 3 at standard print speeds, you're printing this in about an hour. And even printers that advertise being fast are probably doing it in 15 to 25 minutes. This Benchy, I printed on my Rat Rig 400 millimeter in eight minutes, eight and a half minutes. And yeah, it's not the best quality, but that's not really the point. The point is that this was printed insanely fast uh, and it looks like a Benchy. And I was able to do this basically just the standard tuning of the printer. I was able to enter the sub 10 minute Benchy Club without a ton of work, which really says something. And the last thing I wanted to mention was the enclosure, which I've mentioned before. Even with no external heater, just by heating the bed up to 110 Celsius for ABS or nylon, uh, if I leave it for 20 minutes, it'll actually get the entire chamber temperature up to 50 Celsius, which is about 120 Fahrenheit. If you put some insulation on top, you can get it up to about 60 Celsius or 140 Fahrenheit, which is certainly enough to make ASA and ABS behave. And it's enough to get nylons and polycarbonates to behave well enough, at least for like small and medium sized prints. And I want to reiterate, it isn't just that this enclosure retains heat well or it looks good, it's that it's actually a first class feature and they've designed it to have all the electronics on the outside of the enclosure and combined with the Core XY motion system, you can keep all the motors outside the enclosure as well to keep all of that protected from the heat. Most other printers, you just build the printer and then you put a box around it and that works okay at lower chamber temperatures, but once the heat gets up to a certain level, you're going to start having all sorts of problems with your printer. 
That's exactly what happened with my old Maker Gear M2. I put it inside an actively heated box and then I went through a maddening month of failed prints that turned out to just be the motor drivers on the motherboard overheating. So I've got some firsthand experience with this and I have to say it's really nice, especially if you wanna do the higher temperature engineering materials that this is not a problem you're gonna to have to worry about with rat rigs enclosure design. Oh yeah, and one other benefit of the enclosure, it allows you to use your rat rig printer as its own trash can for failed prints. And another major feature of this printer is the operating system and the firmware. RatRig provides something called RatOS, which is a modification of Clipper, which is considered kind of the next generation 3D printer management software firmware. And it is awesome. I've dealt with other printers, Marlin, and compiling my own firmware. Clipper is just such a breath of fresh air and it has so many cool features. It gives you a really nice web user interface uh, to manage the printer, to monitor it, and to configure it. And setting up Red OS is surprisingly easy. I mean, maybe not easy enough for grandma to do, but grandma didn't spend 40 hours building an industrial machine that can set records at speed printing. So easy is relative here, but I think you'll find that it's really not that bad. So here's what you do. You go to the RatRig documentation, you download this image as a single file. Then you use the software that they recommend to burn it to a micro SD card. And then you put it in the pie and you turn it on. And now what? So there's no way for it to know how to get on your Wi-Fi network. So instead what it does is it actually hosts its own Wi-Fi network, which you can then connect to from any device on your network and then plug in your Wi-Fi SSID and password. That's it. Now when you reboot, it won't host its own Wi-Fi network. It'll get on your Wi-Fi network instead and it'll automatically start up and host the web server that's needed to connect to it from your browser from any other device on the network. And then you can start configuring it. The rat rig documentation is actually pretty good. And since it's based on Clipper, a lot of details can be filled in also from going to the Clipper documentation. We'll take a quick look at how you can use the printer and Clipper to actually streamline your printing process. So I'm using Cura right here. This is my preferred slicer of choice, although most in the community use something called Super Slicer. To add the Clipper-based printer, uh, it uses something called Moonraker. You can just Google for Moonraker plugin Cura and you'll find it and then you'll get this little button and you can connect Moonraker and all you do is you plug in the IP address and set a few settings there. Now before I print I like to go over back to the web UI and if you have a webcam you can see whether your print bed is clear which actually it's not I need to go clear off this old skirt from a previous print um, but I, what I also like to do is while I'm messing with Cura is I like to preheat the bed. The extruder is super fast it'll get up to 280 in like less than a minute so I just leave that one alone. So that's heating. Let me go clear that thing from the bed. So now I can come back to Cura and load the model. Let's do some calibration steps. This is just a little model. I actually made it for resin printing, but it'll, we'll give it a shot here. So let me update some of these settings. All right, once all those settings are in, I can click slice. This is standard procedure. I can go and preview it, just see how it's gonna print. Beautiful. And now I don't have to get out an SD card. I don't have to move anything. I just have a button right here that says upload and I can just go ahead and click it. And now it says upload complete and see what it's doing. There's a little snapshot of what it's printing. Now I can watch it do its thing. Let's talk about some downsides. One example is the huge power consumption. Even if I'm printing something small, I still have to heat up this huge build plate. And that consumes a lot of electricity and takes a lot longer than it would if I had a smaller printer. The thing I didn't expect, but I probably should have, was I built this printer, I got the bigger one, because I wanted the option to be able to print big things. But when I went to actually print something big, I realized I was using multiple kilograms of filament. That's not really a problem with the printer. It was just something to know before you get the biggest printer that if you're actually planning to use it to, to like fill the build volume, you're gonna need like five kilogram spools of filament and it's not gonna be cheap. Definitely raises the stakes. Doing a, say a three kilogram print, which might cost you 60 or $70, you run the risk of something going wrong, either a power failure or an extruder jam in the middle of it. And then you've just wasted all that filament. And sometimes you don't want to print big things, you just want to print a whole bunch of little things. And that's certainly a good use of buying a printer with a build plate this size. Another downside of having a printer this big, and especially from RatRig, is they build their printers like a tank. And one of the reasons these things can print so fast is because it has a super sturdy frame made out of thick aluminum. Uh, it has a heavy bed, and that makes it heavy. Uh, I can pick up my other printers, I cannot pick up this one. 
I ended up having to build a dolly to put this thing on, put these special retractable caster wheels on it that um, you can manually drop down little rubber feet to have it stable in place, which you, which you want for printing, but then to be able to put the wheels back down if you want to move it around. So if you're going to buy this printer, you're going to have three main choices. Now, the most important choice you make is how big you want it. The build volumes range from about 200 millimeters cubed, which is about eight inches by eight inches by eight inches, up to 500 millimeters cubed. And that's about 20 inches by 20 inches by 20 inches. And that's just the build volume. The footprint that you're gonna actually have on the ground and in your room is gonna be about 50% bigger than that in each dimension. So take that in, into account when you're buying this printer. Me being in the US, I found the 400 millimeters to be the biggest one I could get that would one, still fit through a standard US door, and two, wasn't gonna blow a breaker when I heated up the bed because the biggest printer has pretty huge power consumption requirements just for heating your, your heated bed. If you're in Europe, that's not a big deal. And if you're in the US, you can still make it work, but just, just, a, just a fair warning. The second major choice you're gonna pick is whether you want the standard configuration or the custom configuration. For the vast majority of people building a printer, the standard configuration is totally fine. I'm the kind of person that wants to dig into the custom configuration, research every option, make spreadsheets and everything. And I can tell you, all the options on the custom configuration are all top notch. Uh, you're getting like five or 10% better, maybe for specific use cases when you customize. Just go with the standard option if you don't know any better. And the final decision you're gonna make is whether you want the printer enclosed. Uh, if you only plan to print mostly PLA, PETG, and TPU, which is a, a pretty big diversity of filaments, you're not going to need an enclosure and it's not going to be worth the trouble. But if you're aiming to build this printer to use it for engineering applications, uh, you're most likely going to be wanting to print with at least ABS and maybe some nylons and polycarbonate. You're definitely going to want the enclosure because you need a nice heated build volume for those things to print well. But this is not a decision to make lightly because this enclosure is expensive and it's a lot of work because RetRig doesn't sell you the enclosure itself. They sell you the hardware to mount the panels on the side of the machine, but they don't sell you the panels. You have to either get them from a third party or buy stock polycarbonate panels and download the cut files from RetRig and take them to a machine shop to get them cut for you. If you do want your printer enclosed and you don't want to deal with cutting it yourself, you can spend about $100 from RetRig to buy the hardware and another couple hundred dollars to buy the pre-cut panels from a third party. And there we have it. That's either the end of the beginning or the end of the end, depending which order you're watching these videos in. Obviously, I had a ton of fun building this printer. I had a ton of fun showing off the process. I hope you really enjoyed it. And one last thing, throughout the process of publishing these videos, I have gotten feedback in the comments on individual videos. I do read those, I do respond to them. There tend to be corrections as well, people pointing out stuff that I either didn't do right or, or explained wrong. So I will include corrections in the descriptions as you're going through the videos. Just be sure to check that before you depend on any specific information that I included in these videos. As you saw earlier in the video, I have been and plan to keep using this printer for more weird and fun projects that I'm working on. So make sure you hit that like and subscribe button if you don't want to miss those things. Thanks for watching.